Good evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, our March uh, monthly uh, lecture, and I'm very pleased to have with us today Miss Minerva King, uh, who is a lifelong member of St. Mark's Episcopal Church, uh, and um, is the daughter of the former chairperson of the Charleston County NAACP. Uh, Minerva grew up uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, and uh, she is a storyteller and an activist uh, here in the city. Uh, she serves with me as a member of the uh, Diocesan Racial Justice and Reconciliation Commission. She's also very involved uh, as we are here at St. Stephen's uh, with the Charleston Area uh, Justice Ministry. And she will be sharing uh, stories with us this evening about growing up uh, in Charleston during the Civil Rights Movement and other things that you want to share with us. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, all are welcome following this to continue the conversation uh, at a reception that we'll have in Stevens Hall. But before I turn it over to Minerva, let's begin with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Minerva King. Thank you so much, Adam. Can I be heard all the way in the back? Okay. All right. If, if you can't hear me, just raise your right hand. Not your left, but your right hand. Okay. All right. Um, I'll let you on a little secret. I used to have a pretty decent singing voice. And that was a long time ago before I started abusing my voice and having allergies and colds and that sort of thing, and not to mention the smoking, years of smoking. So I've got a sort of not so good voice now with singing. So I'm telling you all that because I'm going to ask you to help me sing. Okay, are you up to it? Yeah, sure. All right. I'm going to sit at the welcome table. I'm going to sit at the welcome table one of these days, hallelujah. I'm going to sit at the welcome table. Going to sit at the welcome table one of these days, one of these days. That, of course, was a, a song that came out of the rural black church in the South. And um, that was one of the songs that, that kept us going through the Civil Rights Movement. Um, another one was, Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me, over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free and be free. Now, after a while, we st uh, started sort of changing some of the lyrics to these songs to, to fit the occasions. For example, um, let's see. Over my head, I see Jesus in the air. Became over my head, I see freedom in the air. Over my head, I see freedom in the air. Over my head, I see freedom in the air. There must be a God somewhere. And this one may be a little bit more familiar to you. Paul and Silas bound in jail had no money for to go their bail. Keep your hands on the plow. Hold on, hold on. We changed the words to that one too. Paul and Silas bound in jail had no money for to go their bail. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Of course, the song that we most readily associate with the Civil Rights Movement is one that, believe it or not, got its start, its humble start right here in our community, Charleston, South Carolina. 
Back in 1947, there was a labor union that had already been organized, and they went on strike. They worked at the cigar factory. Now, the cigar factory was not um, a, exactly a high-paying job. They paid something like 37 cents an hour. The conditions were horrible. There was no air conditioning back then, of course, and people kept getting uh, sick respiratory problems because of uh, uh, the, the fumes from the tobacco and, and the cigars. Well, they decided they were gonna put an end to that, the uh, members of the labor union, and they went on strike in October of 1947. Well, after about 100 days of that strike, some of the people sort of lost faith and they decided that low pay was better than no pay at all. So they started going back to work. One day, a woman from Johns Island, South Carolina, her name was Alice Wine, W-I-N-E. She was walking by and she noticed that the spirits of the people were sagging. And so just to give them some inspiration, she started singing. I want to walk with him. I want to talk with him. I want to walk with him one day. Oh, down in my heart, oh, Lordy, I do believe. I want to walk with him one day. And that sort of lifted the spirits of the people, and they were able to continue. And this strike lasted all of six months. And it wasn't entirely successful, but the salary, the, the wages were raised from 37 cents an hour all the way up to 45 cents an hour. This woman, Alice Wine, who had something like a third grade education, could barely read and write, taught herself math when she worked in a little store. She taught herself to make change by using matchsticks, much as we would use an abacus maybe. But anyhow, um, she had the occasion in the late 40s to go with Esau Jenkins, and I think most people have heard that name before. He was uh, quite the activist and quite the entrepreneur. He himself only had a third grade education. I'm sorry, fourth grade education. But this man was so smart, he actually taught himself to speak Greek as an adult so that he could deal with the, the Greek uh, merchants that were very prevalent in Charleston at that, at that time. Well, Mr. Esau Jenkins took Alice Wine up to Highlander Folk School in Mount Eagle, Tennessee. Has anybody ever heard of Highlander? Yeah, you're familiar with it? Well, for the others who aren't, Highlander Folk School was founded in 1932 by Miles Horton. Miles had the occasion to go to Europe, to travel around Europe, and when he got to Scandinavia, he studied the folk schools in Scandinavia. Now these were schools that were not set up where people would go and get degrees or, or uh, diplomas. They went to these folk schools to uh, get skills and how they could take back to their families and their, their communities to make them better. So Miles said, well, you know, this is working over here. Let me try this in America. And his family owned a huge piece of land in the Cumberland Mountains not too, about 50 miles from Chattanooga. And so, um, uh, Alice Wine went with Esau Jenkins and they spent some time up there. And one night, Alice Wine sat down with Zilphia Horton, who was the wife of Miles Horton, the director. She was a professional musician, folklorist and folk singer. And Alice Wine taught Zilphia the song that I just sang. And not too long after that, Zilphia had the occasion to go to New York and visit her friend, Pete Seeger. <laughs> Everybody's familiar? Pete Seeger. And she taught him the song, and they sat down one night, and they uh, started just making up verses, one after the other, after the other. And Pete Seeger, being the total musician and, and activist that he was, took that song, he spread it all over the country. He took it to Oakland, California. He took it to Albany, and I'm saying that on purpose. In New York, it's Albany, but in Georgia, it's Albany. That's how they pronounce it. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> um, he took the song to 
what they not so affectionately called Birmingham, Birmingham, Alabama, obviously because so many of the churches and the houses had been bombed. Took it to Rock Hill, South Carolina. Even took it up to New York when he was trying to clean up the, the Hudson River up there. But you know, that song was not satisfied just staying here in America. It traveled across the Atlantic Ocean. It was sung by the Mau Mau Raiders in Kenya, in East Africa. It was sung by Lekwalensis Solidarity workers in Poland. It was sung by the students in Tiananmen Square in China. That song has been translated into virtually hundreds of languages, and it has become the universal anthem of people who are fighting for social justice. You know, you know the song, don't you? We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. occasion to visit Highland the Folk School for the first time. I was 12 years old in 1956. Well, I've just given my age, haven't I? <laughs> well, oh, <laughs> I'm wondering what I hear and things. Um, it was an exciting time for us. Other than the little Greek girls who lived in our neighborhood who we used to play with, and they were friend, we were friends. And I can't remember what it was, but we had a little disagreement. They told us to go home. But before they told us to go home, they called us crackers. The little Greek girls called us crackers. They were a little confused. <laughs> <laughs> we never corrected them. We just went home. But um, other than that, that was probably the first experience I ever had with dealing with whites on an equal basis. And that made it exciting enough. Also, it was exciting because of some of the people who were there that summer. Pete Seeger was there. Rosa Parks was there. Eleanor Roosevelt was there. Andrew Young was there. And last but not least, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was there. He was just a young, young Baptist preacher and from Atlanta, Georgia, nobody had ever heard of him before. Imagine that. Well, around that time, we're talking about the mid-50s then, things started sort of stirring up. People had come back from World War II and the soldiers were demanding certain, certain rights and so forth. It was after the Brown versus Board of Education, um, Topeka, Kansas, was 1954. And people were really becoming uh, very active in, in the civil rights movement. I guess my first action was at the age of 12 when a friend of mine, Leela Potts, whose father, John Potts, was the last president of, uh, principal of Avery Institute, decided we were just going to go downtown. We're going to take a city bus and we're going to go downtown. And Rosa Parks had already done her thing, so we figured maybe we could try it too. And it was, we just did it on the spur of a moment. And we got on the bus. And you know, the bus driver sits here, and there's a long bench seat behind him, and then a long bench seat just opposite. Well, we sat on that one just opposite him. And uh, he didn't tell us to move, but I will never forget the look on his face and his words. He looked at us with the coldest steel gray eyes I've ever seen in my life. And he said, live dangerously, die young. I wish that bus driver were around today so I could tell him and show him that I lived dangerously, but obviously I did not die young. Around that time, that was when my dad was the uh, local president of NAACP. He was that, in that position for five years. And then he moved up and became state president for five years as well. So 
pretty much the whole family grew up in this movement. We just, we, we did certain things without, without asking or questioning or wondering why we were, we were doing it. It was normal life for us. Um, when I was uh, 15, the N local NAACP filed a lawsuit. Uh, we were trying to desegregate the schools. And um, I was close to, I was almost, well, I was graduating the next year at 16. And when the local school board found out that I was going to graduate soon, then they started just dragging their feet and dragging their feet, delaying, making one delay after the other, you know, to avoid this. And they were just about to throw the suit out, saying it was a moot issue then. Well, my father, in his ultimate wisdom, said, aha, I've got an ace up my sleeve. I've got another daughter who's four years younger than I am, Millicent. And she, in 1963, and 10 others, were able to successfully desegregate the local schools. Ah. I'm thinking now, around that time, or perhaps a little before, was when the Klan started coming out. And I can vividly remember, on at least two occasions, the Klan burning a cross in front of our, our house. I also remember not being even a little afraid. We were not afraid. And I think largely because our, our parents were so calm. They were passionate about this, but they were calm, too. And they didn't show any fear if they had it. So we simply emulated their behavior. Also at age 15, exactly two months after the first official sit-in demonstration, uh, February 1st um, in Greensboro, North Carolina, the first sit-in demonstration occurred in Savannah on March 1st. And a month after that, the first demonstration occurred here in Charleston, and I was a part of that. We were 24 students from Burke High School. I was the youngest at 15. And um, we prepared for it for quite some time. We had a lot of role playing. You know, what, what happened? What are you going to do if somebody comes up to you and, and they, they, they curse you or they, they hit you, they kick you, they spit on you, they pour ketchup on your face, whatever? Fortunately, none of that happened. But we were fully prepared to not retaliate in any way because we knew that that would not solve the problem at all. So we chose a day that was a teacher's work day. And all 24 of us all dressed up. And by the way, my father didn't even know about this. It was a student-led demonstration, strictly high school students. And all dressed up in our Sunday best. We had uh, some adults drive us downtown. And we were going to tried to desegregate the lunch counter at Woolworths. But somehow, the people at Woolworths got the word, and they closed the lunch counter down. But that's OK. We had a contingency plan. We turned right around, and we went to Crest. And I guess Crest didn't get the word in time, so <laughs> <laughs> too late. <laughs> but we sat there ever so quietly. And um, almost immediately, the manager came out and told us we had to leave, because he wasn't going to serve us. We, did, we just ignored that. We did not talk to each other except every now and then to say the Lord's Prayer or the 23rd Psalm. They sent the kitchen help out to tell us, you better get, come on, you're going to get kicked out of school. You go, you go on, don't go on, don't, don't do this. You're going to ruin your, your, your life. You might get arrested. You'll have a police record. We ignored that. After a while, they sent one of the waitresses out and she poured strong ammonia all over the counter. Do you know what ammonia smells like? It's not pleasant, is it? It gets in your nose and your eyes and your throat and so forth. We didn't move. Eventually, the manager came out and said, somebody has planted a bomb in this building. <laughs> well, now, you know what those lunch counters look like with the, with the mirror facing the, the, the stools? And it, the mirror is the whole uh, width of the, of, the, of the lunch counter, so we could see the whole store from where we were. And people were milling around, they were shopping, and the cashiers were there, so we knew that, you know, quite naturally they hadn't been bombed. But in the event, that didn't work either. So finally, finally, after five and a half 
hours of sitting on that lunch, on those uh, stools at the lunch counter. Uh, the police were called and they arrested us. And we were taken to what was the city jail then at that time on St. Philip Street. Remember Gary? Not that you would know about the city jail. Yeah, yeah, no, not I just know he's a Charlestonian, so he would know about it. Um, and uh, we were there maybe a couple of hours, and then the, uh, the, the organization came and, and um, uh, got us out. Now, that was the first time I went to jail. The second time was a bit more dramatic. After high school, I went away to college in central Missouri, Jefferson City. And then came, I would come home summers, of course. So in the summer of 63, I was there. And by this time, the, the, the movement had really reached sort of a feverish peach, uh, peak. And um, you know, there were sit-ins and wait-ins and walk-ins and drive-ins and even look-ins. Just people were, were really um, activated. Well, at this point, we had mass meetings every evening at a different church. We used Emmanuel quite a bit. We used Morris Street Baptist. We used Ebenezer AME. We used St. Luke's. Believe it or not, we even had a mass meeting at St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Oh, good thing. A very, very conservative elitist church. Well, at that point, um, there were two newspapers in Charleston, the News and Courier and the Charleston Evening Post. Eventually, they merged and became the Post and Courier. The News and Courier had the uh, reputation for uh, being very slanted in their, in their writings. And whenever we had a, 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 a mass meeting, we could have maybe four or 500 people. But they would report, oh, there were 35, 40, 50 people, you know, that sort of thing. So we decided after this, mass meeting at St. Louis Amy Church was on St. Philip Street also. We would do a silent march down to the Post and Courier building, and we did that. Well, somewhere along the way, it was said that someone threw a brick. We know it wasn't anybody in our group. We know that, okay? But anyhow, that gave the police the reason to start arresting us. They did. Now, I have another sister, Jonelle, who at that point was probably in grad school in Ohio, but she was there for the summer as well. And she was very active, uh, both in undergraduate and graduate school, uh, in the movement. But she had had the misfortune of never having been arrested. You see, it was a badge of honor. So when the police came close to her, she said, she turned to us and said, oh, I think I'm going to get arrested this time. <laughs> but it was not to be. It was a, a day like this, and we had umbrellas. She turned like this to give her umbrella to our mother. And when she turned her back, they passed right by her. <laughs> and, they got, and they took me. They just sort of grabbed young people out of the, the crowd. Um, and, well, you know, I think there's something humorous to be found in almost every situation. And this was no exception. They put us on one of the buses that was like originally a school bus, but they forgot to lock the back door. And when some of the fellas realized that, they walked out the back door. Now, you think they went home? Not a chance. No, they came around so they could be arrested again. There were a couple of guys who got arrested three times that night before the cops realized who they were. But they finally did, and they locked the door. And they took us to an old jail. It was probably built in the early 1800s. They called it the Sea Breeze Hotel. It was right on the edge. You've heard? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's right on the edge of the, uh, the Cooper River. Ancient building, no air conditioning. Now, there are 31 of us who got arrested, 15 boys, 16 girls. All 15 boys were in one cell. All 16 girls were in another cell, OK? You can imagine what that's like. Hot as the dickens, no air conditioning. And you know those bugs that come out in the summertime that fly, the palmetto bugs? I'm deathly afraid of them, and they were just all over the place. Ugh. So I, I really don't know how I did it. I could not do it today, but you know, young people can do things like that. One thing, well, we sang a lot. Well, let me describe the food. Ugh. 
For breakfast, we had cold grits, cold, coarse yellow grits, and hard biscuits, which you could probably bowl with, and some sort of meat. It was like what they call butts meat, fat back. It's not something but fat, but just one little thin line of, of meat in between. Okay. So that's what we had. Couldn't eat it. For lunch, we had baked beans, those same hard rolls that we had taken back, or the, the, uh, the, the biscuits. And for dinner, it was the same thing. I'll never forget there was a jailer. His last name was Hogan. And he just delighted in coming to the girls' cell. Because at one point, it was so hot, we were <coughs> undressed to our, to our under underwear. It was just that hot. And he just delighted in coming in and peeping in. Oh, well, anyhow, one thing that got me through that, I don't know why, but I'd put a book in my, well, I do know why. <laughs> I always have a book with me. <laughs> but I put a book in my purse, and that book was Ready From Within. It's the autobiography of Septima P. Clark. And I think just reading that book gave me some comfort and some courage. And by the way, I'm pause right here. If you have not seen the play Septima, it's here, wasn't it? I saw it last night. It is a wonderful local production at the Pure Theater. I would strongly suggest that you try to get tickets if, if they're not sold out of it until April 1st. Ah, Oh, yeah, uh-huh. It is really, really good. It's the story of Septima P. Clark, and I'm not... Mm -hmm. I, I didn't the mention her. Like, That's all the people she was saying. there. She was there. Yeah. Um, and, and that came out in the play, remember? Um, the, the, she was head of the education uh, uh, at, at uh, Highlander. Yeah. So let's see now. The book. Okay. So after three nights and four days, uh, the NAACP uh, paid our bond and, and we, we were let out. Fortunately, um, years later, our records were expunged, so I didn't have to worry about being a jailbird for the rest of my life. Okay, went back to school at the end of, uh, at the, end of the summer. Of course, in between now, we're, it was like going to a job. Uh, we sort of were headquartered at Emmanuel Amy Church in the basement where the tragedy took place. And um, we would go, we'd get up early in the morning, we'd go down there, we'd make our picket signs, and we'd walk on King Street and picket until it was lunchtime, then we'd go back to Emmanuel and have our lunch, and then after lunch, we'd go back and picket. So that was our routine, but it was good practice. Well, anyhow, I went back and uh, finished, uh, I'm gonna speed it up a little bit now, um, I finished uh, Lincoln uh, University, and then uh, came back to Charleston to work. Taught in the school system for about a year, but I realized that just wasn't going to work. The pay was terrible, for one thing. Um, so then I worked there for a year and then um, went to work at the Charleston County Public Library. By that time, I'd earned a master's degree in library science, so um, that was the thing to do. Well, I worked there rather successfully, and then there was an opportunity to get a promotion and I applied for it, and I was the best qualified person. I'm not saying that from a subjective standpoint. I really was the best qualified person, but they hired a white woman from outside who didn't know anything about the job. So I filed a grievance, and after many, many months of negotiation, we settled, and I got the promotion. Um, I used, when I tell this story to young people, I usually say, do what you have to do. If you're in that position, you have to defend yourself. You have to do what's right for you. But I hope you never, ever, ever have to file a grievance and win it. Because management never forgives and management never forgets. And that's what happened to me. A few years later, about four months after receiving an excellent evaluation, I was terminated by the Charleston County Public Library. They didn't have to give me a reason. This is a right to work state. Mm -hmm. They can fire you for no reason at all. And um, 
But, but you know, I, I do believe that God closes the door and opens another one, or at least a window. If he doesn't open a door for you, he at least a window for you. And that's what happened to me. A day and a half after my last day at the Charleston County Public Library, I was on a train going to Baltimore. And for the next five days, I attended a festival that was given by the National Association of Black Storytellers, a group that I'm active with now. And during one of the evening exercises, the MC asked to see the hands of all the storytellers. Some invisible force <laughs> made my hand go up without even thinking. You've heard the expression, naming it and claiming it? Mm -hmm. That's what I did. I named it and I claimed it. I became a storyteller. And from that day on, I've been telling stories. I do most of it here in the South Carolina under the uh, South Carolina Arts Commission or individual uh, North, North Charleston Arts Council. Occasionally, I will go outside of South Carolina. I've done some storytelling in North Carolina, Ohio, California, Georgia. But mostly, I stay here. And I tell my stories, including the one that I just told you. I'm going to tell God how you treat me. Oh, I'm going to tell God how you treat me one of these days. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell God how you treat me. Going to tell God how you treat me one of these days once more. I'm going to sit at the welcome table. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for Q&A, if anybody wants to, or, or wants to make comments. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Thank you for coming. <laughs> But Pete Seeger is the one who really took it and developed it. And, and, and that was a thrill meeting Pete Seeger. I'd never heard of him before. I was just a kid, you know, 12 years old. And uh, just thoroughly charming, down to earth. Loved playing that banjo <coughs> and singing. Loved people. Loved justice. Yeah, Gary. He played that song in the Customs House with David Stahl. Get out of here. Yeah. How did I miss that? Ooh. How did I miss that? He had, has, has a daughter, I know. Okay. Wow. Great. Yes, sir. Oh, is that right? How is it different? Um, a little freer, but um, not devoid of, of racial prejudice, for sure. You know, even to this day. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, Lincoln is really the center of, uh, that, that's where most of the black folks in, in Jeff City are one way or another connected with Lincoln University, which, by the way, is now about a third line, I think. Uh, the university. The university. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Put it down in the right time. How do you, how do you find Some changes simply because of um, the folks who have come in from, from other cities and they've brought with them their own way of thinking. However, sometimes it doesn't help because they sort of fall right in line and adopt the, the locals' uh, you know, way of thinking. But um, 
Hmm. You know, of course, everything is open as far as, uh, you know, public accommodations are concerned. So that was, that's different from when I was growing up. But unfortunately, uh, desegregation and integration did help, but it did hurt the black community. Um, for example, um, there's a street downtown that's not too far from the church, Morris Street. Morris Street was sort of like um, Sweet Auburn in Atlanta on a small scale. It's where a lot of our uh, black businessmen and, and, and professional people were. And now I think there's only one. We had a, a motel and a couple of restaurants there. And I think <laughs> in our desire to be accepted by the larger community, we sort of forgot what we had. We had that tight-knit um, community that supported itself. And it's, it's gone. I know who's your greatest influence. Uh, I know who's your state of father. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's a toughie. I think, I think Seppi was. I think Seppi might. I, you might say that she was a great influence. Se Septima. We called her Seppi. Um, she was a great influence. Um, fortunately, when I was growing up, we had. Uh, several people coming through and staying with us. Roy Wilkins, who was for years the grand executive secretary of the NAACP, he, uh, he stayed with us. Marguerite Belafonte, Harry Belafonte's ex-wife, uh, stayed with us. Um, Ralph Abernathy, who was Martin Luther King's um, right-hand man. I think all of these people, you know, had, had an impact on me in the way I think. But you were young at that point, correct? Yeah, well, 12, 13, 14? Uh, is that well, that's amazing. not that young. That's, that's young? Oh, yeah? That you're like, okay, I'm going to remember what they said, I'm going to remember what they did. I do. Uh huh. I'm going to act on that. I mean, you're 12 years old. Uh huh. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things I don't remember, but I've tried to hold on to it. And believe it or not, telling the story helps me remember some things. Yeah. Miles Horton was a great influence on me. I had never met a white man who was that, how shall I say, pure of heart, that non-racist, loved people, loved people unconditionally, all people. And that was, that was a great thing for me. First of all, it took exactly 100 years for blacks to even get into the, the uh, diocesan convention because the church was founded in 1865, 1965. And I remember my father and others being just so thrilled that you know, it finally came about. And St. Mark's pretty much led the way of, uh, for, for the other Episcopal churches. We were sort of supposed to. And I've done a fair amount. I'm also on the, the board of the Avery Institute, and I've done a fair amount of research there. I need to do a lot more. But I, I came across some articles um, that were written in, in the newspaper, and one of them indicated that um, there were some diocesan leaders who thought it might not be a bad idea to, to let the St. Mark's people in, because they were, St. Mark's people, I don't know if, does anybody know anything about St. Mark's? Historically, they are rather elitist, and they are colorist. Okay, if you are back in the old days, okay, let me put it to you this way. A typical Sunday, let's just say, and we had a large congregation there, and I'd say a typical Sunday, maybe 80, 100 people. Two people who were, had dark skin, okay? But 
This article also goes on to say that the people who wanted to include St. Mark's thought it was a bad idea because after all, they said the mixed race men would then go after the white women. <laughs> so that was mixed. <laughs> um, all, very conservative, um, uh, a lot of um, professional people, a lot of, even the ones who weren't professional um, were property owners and they had, they had money. Um, so they sort of kind of enjoyed a certain status in, in, in Charleston. And there were enough of them that they supported each other. You know, it's like one big club. And to be perfectly honest with you, I think that has led to a lot to the condition that St. Mark's is in now. We don't have the congregation. The young people have moved away. The old people have died. And um, that's why we have folks like Judith and Norm, and, <laughs> and where's Sharon? Sharon to come, Gary, <laughs> and Suzanne, to help us sort of figure it out. We're gonna find a way, we're gonna find a way. Yeah. But were there other people at St. Mark's oh, yes. who, were, who were involved in uh, this? No, no. Was well, let, let me, let me uh, modify that a little bit. Generally, no, as a matter of fact, when we decided that we were going to have that one mass meeting. Some of the good church uh, people went downtown and, and uh, uh, practically begged the bishop to not let it happen. I think it was Bishop Salmon at that time. And he said, no. No, no, I'm not going to stop it, is what he said. But my, my mother declared that that night it seemed like people sang the loudest they had ever sung, <laughs> just in defiance, you know, because of where we were. Um, some, there were maybe, I can name maybe two people who were supportive. Eugene Hunt, who was a professor at the College of Charleston, first black professor, I think. Um, but he, you know, you had to be very careful. Back in those days, if you belonged to the NAACP, you, you lost your job, any, any government job. My father's sister was uh, a teacher up in Williamsburg County, King Street. And when they found out that that was her brother, she didn't get a contract. Now, she'd been teaching successfully for years and years and years. She didn't get a contract. But that's okay, because then she went to North Carolina uh, and went to library school and became a librarian. She was happier than that. But uh, see, God gave her that window. <laughs> but uh, no, there was, there was real resistance. But, and this is something, you, you mentioned that um, Gail DaCosta had a, a, a revelation yesterday. Don't tell her, please. But I've got a revelation for her. I only found out about 10 years or so ago that it was Gail DaCosta's father who put up the money to get the 31 of us out of jail that time. I, don't, I, bet, I bet she doesn't know it. Don't tell her. I want to tell her. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, no, it was not a popular thing. Julia Ellen's uncle, her, her mother's uh, brother. Mm -hmm. He was a pretty prominent um, contractor and um, did a lot of preservation work for downtown homes and churches, including, remember? You were gonna tell them that? Yeah, yeah, and Gail just found that out yesterday at the meeting. <laughs> did that answer your question, Anna? Yeah. Okay. What if you have a favorite memory of story you tell us about the Reverend Henry Grant? Oh. Henry Grant was just, uh, and he was just, they, they, God just threw away the mold with him after he made Henry Grant. Um, of course, I, I knew him as a child, too, so I have to give you that perspective. Henry Grant was, for years, the priest at St. John's, um, here on the east side, not here, but on the east side. And um, he just, I, I knew him from Camp Baskerville. I went to Camp Baskerville, and uh, he, he worked there um, sometimes. Um, but he was quite the civil rights activist. He, he and my father were, were close, very close. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was at, eventually at St. John's and at St. Stephen's. Oh, what? Wow. Henry Grant is still the longest serving priest of this church. Wow. Yeah. What would that be? Like 15, that 20 years? 
adjust the storytelling even I went back in the school system. Trust me, kicking and screaming I went back in the school system. But um, I do mostly schools at this point and occasionally conferences. Um, I'm going to, I have a, a residency scheduled for uh, next month in Dorchester County, Sedgefield Middle School. I had a great program last Saturday at the Gibbs Museum. I do museums too. And uh, by the way, <laughs> while you're trying to get tickets for Septima, you might want to just go to the Gibbs and there's a wonderful um, exhibit called Unnatural Selections. And all sorts of uh, exhibits of, of animals. And uh, it, it's, worth, it's worth a trip to the Gibbs. I guess about six months ago, for a group of uh, educators who were coming through Charleston, and uh, we did that. But um, yeah, I'd love to do more of that. We also visited St. Mark's during the Spoleto, and they were wonderful. Oh yeah. 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 We've we've done some of it, but not enough at St. Mark's. Yeah. No, we haven't. No, we haven't. I, I really do enjoy that. And you know, I, I tell primarily to, to children, but they're not my favorite group. I really like telling to adults. But this piece is like children. <laughs> 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 and the, I'll I'll <laughs> the best audiences for me are uh, senior citizens, mm -hmm. especially those who grew up on radio, listening to radio, mm -hmm. and they miss it. And you listen, having a live storytelling in front of them is just reminiscent of, of sitting around, because I can remember as a little kid sitting around the radio. That was a great activity on Sunday night. Mm -hmm. Boston Market. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.